Hey everybody, happy Friday. Welcome to Love and Reload, the voice of the relocation industry. I am your host, Ben Cross, and I am so blessed and fortunate to be here today with Jody Harris from Johnson Controls. She is the chief cook and bottle washer of Total Rewards over there. <laughs> no, her actual real title is Global Mobility, Immigration, Disability, Wellness, aka the queen of long titles. We've got the queen in the house. I can't wait to talk to her. She's got some fantastic stories. Can't wait to hear about her mobility story and all the craziness that ensues in the relocation biz. Um, but before we get to that and bring her out, let's go ahead and talk about our book. Book Club Book of the Month is... Take control of your job search written by Miss Lauren Herring, CEO of Impact Group. If you yourself is out of a job or you know someone who is, and let's face it, we all probably do, grab this book. If you want a free copy, you can come on Love and Reload on August 31st and discuss this book live with us. And Lauren will send you a free autographed copy for yourself. Um, so that's really cool. We're going to be talking about that Monday, August 31st, which will actually be our next show because janet and i are taking a week-long vacation now before you start any rumors it's not together okay we're vacationing separately with our respective spouses okay no shenanigans no we are we're taking a week off um we just need to recharge the battery so um so we won't be on next monday but we will be on the monday following which is the 31st i believe um also i want to go ahead and thank our sponsor today uh, the IAM conference is coming up in October, just like the in-person event you're familiar with. The virtual annual meeting and expo will be filled with opportunities for networking with your fellow IAM members, global mobility experts, and conducting demonstrations of products and services and nurturing relationships with other professionals in the field of global mobility, relocation, and moving. No masks are required and your time zone is no limit with 24-hour real-time attendance and access to the recorded sessions from LATAM, APAC, EMEA, everywhere um, up to 30 days post-conference and with free registrations for all corporate members. Um, just hit me up if you need a promo code for that free registration, go to IAMmeetings.com to register today. So without further ado, the guest you've all been waiting for, Jody Harris. How's it going, Jody? <laughs> Not too shabby. How about yourself, Ben? I am so excited right now. Okay. I mean, I know this is like my thing. I know, but I'm so excited because I, I get a week off. I, I mean, know, so right? Today's my day off. I, I'm doing this for it? fun. Yeah. You're doing yeah. this for fun? This is, how, this is how I recharge my batteries, you know, actually talk to people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, this is great. I'm so happy you're here. This is like really cool. Um, where in the world are you? Before we get to the comments to see people checking in right yeah. now, where in the world are you right now? I am in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, when you have to say it slightly nasally, Milwaukee. Otherwise, you know, my I, I'm I'm a redneck from way back, so I, I got a bit of a southern accent. Where so are you I, from I, originally? I'm from Virginia. Okay. And you can hear it when I say Virginia. <laughs> Is it now now Southern Virginia or Northern Virginia? Well, or Western Virginia. Northern Northern Virginia, but I'm not not the DC area. I, you know, still the country. Um, but okay. I still I still spent a lot of time in and around Northern Virginia and Washington DC area and stuff like that. So I always tell people I'm from Washington DC, but then they hear the you know when I talk to my family, it's like the redneck comes back. You know? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm like I'm like that way yeah. with uh, you know my New York accent comes out when I get a little have a couple pops or something get a little uh, agitated it comes out. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> for sure. For sure. Yeah, we got a bunch of people checking in, everybody. Um, we're going to be taking questions, taking your questions as well. So Jody uh, has, uh, has promised me that we can just ask her whatever we want. So yeah, it's gonna be a I'm lot open of for anything. Uh, okay. I will say COVID has made, as I am not the type of person that during COVID, I'm trying to solve all the world's problems. I am trying to stay sane. I'm trying to keep calm. I'm trying to make sure that my family comes out of this still loving each other. Um, you know, no dead bodies lying around. I, I'm good. So yeah, uh, we're taking this as it comes. Well, you know how you prevent dead bodies uh, lying around? Is you you bury them. Actually, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm in an apartment. It's a little difficult. <laughs> Always dispose of the dead body. All right. Uh, anyway, practical advice. More to come. Uh, let's see. We got Tammy Nelson of Law. So excited oh, to be hey, here. Tommy, Tammy. I her and I went to high school together. By the way. Wow. Yes. See, that's cool. <laughs> Yeah. That's cool. Hey, Tammy, feel free to tell any high school stories about Jody. No, oh, God, please don't. <laughs> In fact, if you got any photos or anything like that, you want to just cut and paste. Just I will say, go ahead and show those. 
I looked really good in high school. <laughs> Isn't it like weird? It's like yeah. there's a there's like a curve of how you feel about your high school photo where it's like, oh God, please don't show that. Oh hey, hey, definitely please show that. Yeah. Yeah. I looked good in high school. Crazy hair and all. <laughs> Fantastic. Jamie Massler, hi, Ben and Jody. Happy Friday and cheers from rainy Mississippi. What's up, Jamie? Drew Phillips. Hey, love and reload fam. Drew here with Sterling Lexicon turning, tuning in as I escape smoky California. Drew, it's always on fire in California and you're always the first to report it. It's kind of a coincidence. I feel like it should be investigated. Drew, can you account for your whereabouts when this when the fire started? I, I, think, I think it's a fair question, Drew. Stay safe out there, buddy. Uh, ben Suki, a good evening from London. What's up, Ben? It's my better looking Ben half. He was on yesterday. Sandra Clary, Clary Jody, good to see you here. Another Virginian as well. Yeah, good to see you too, Sandra. Katie Linehan, wahoo. I can't say wah wahoo. <laughs> if you're from Virginia, it's yeehaw. <laughs> yeehaw. I can say that better. Hi, Jody, the best, the best, the best. Look, look at that. A big Florida hello to Ben and Jody from Tammy. Casey Gale checking in from PC Housing in San Diego. Very nice. Patricia. Hi, Jody. Nice to see you. Look at this. Hello. I love, I meet so many, I'll be honest, I meet so many great people in the Relo industry. I, I really do. And that's probably one of the things that keeps me going is, you know, people like yourself, people like Shannon. Oh, God, Shannon. Sh ask Shannon about the, one day about the banana costume. Um, Shannon, tell us <laughs> about the banana costume, please, in the comments ASAP. Continue, Jody. Uh, but, yeah, so so people like Shannon, people like Pat, people like Tammy. I mean, I was lucky to know Tammy before, but, uh, you know, re reconnecting and, and realizing we were both in the same industry it was just super cool. Um, so Tammy's but, also in the global mobility industry? Well, she's in, she's in real question. She's in real estate. Oh, wow. So, yeah. wow, it's small yeah. world. I had a high school friend like that, too, that I ran into at a conference. And I'm like, Joanna, we went to high school together, and she was in corporate housing in Connecticut. And it's like, yep. what are you doing here? What are you doing here? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, yeah, it, it just the, the people that I've met in this industry, they're just fantastic. They're, they're energetic people. They're um, super friendly, always willing to, to lend a hand, always willing to help out, always willing to, to uh, you know, talk about and, and bounce ideas off of and, and things like that. So it's just, so, it's been a lot of fun. Let's talk about that though, right? Yeah. So, so how, tell us how you got into global mobility. How did you get started? So I feel like everybody in global mobility, especially on the corporate side, has kind of fallen into it accidentally. Um, and I am no exception to that. So there was an article that I did uh, for it, Costumes to Customs. So it was uh, an article awesome that title. I did. Yeah, which was I wrote when I was back at uh, Move, Guide, Move Guides, now at now Topia. Um, mm -hmm. And it was kind of my journey uh, into mobility. And it, it, Basically, I started out with a degree in costume history and fashion design. Um, so I don't wear skirts. I'm not a dressy type person. I'm a t-shirt with a, you know, fancy jacket and slacks uh, type. That's my kind of go-to outfit, mm -hmm. except when I wear a costume. And then there will be bustles and corsets and, you know, all kinds of crazy stuff. You got to tell me. So I got to hear about these costumes. We got bustles and corsets. Okay. Yeah, you I, mean, I like historical costumes. And so my mm -hmm. husband and I, when we got married, it was in costume. Uh, you know, it was a Renaissance themed wedding and, uh, it was, I made everybody was there like up. turkey legs and stuff on the menu. There was, there was large quantities of meat on a stick. Um, you know, it was, yes. it was fantastic. We sat on hay bales. It was outside at an old, um, uh, farmhouse that had been renovated to look like a medieval thatched roof cottage. It was beautiful. It was absolutely beautiful, but yeah, it was us. I met my husband and we, we actually both loved Renaissance fairs and, um, one of the things I think I miss most right now during COVID is all the Renaissance fairs are closed. And so I have no place to wear my costumes. <laughs> That's why I do these shows so I can wear my costume, which is a suit and tie. Cause I like, right? to wear, it's like <laughs> kind of inappropriate nowadays to be wearing like dress clothes or something. Yeah. I get to come on here and get dressed up for everybody. No, I told so, you this. so at a Renaissance, okay. I got to stay on this just for one second. Okay. At a Renaissance <laughs> festival, 
um, you know, don't they do kind of like the roles and stuff and like, okay, I have a job here at this festival or like what, what kind so, of, so people, you, know, you know, the people that work there are uh, professional actors and entertainers and very talented musicians. Um, and they do, you know, you go there and it's like being a, in a walk-in play. There is mm -hmm. an action or a story that's being told throughout the Renaissance Fair. But then you also have, the the people that are walking around just dressed up and having fun with it and eating turkey legs and you know uh drinking large quantities of alcohol and you know it's just a really good time everybody's there to have fun everybody's relaxed we're all enjoying we're getting a little sun you know sunshine and um you know you're outside and you're just you're just having a lot of fun so you know my kids have gone to renaissance fairs since the day they were born and my husband and i um, that's kind of one of our things because it always yeah. tends to happen right around this time of the year, which yeah. is our anniversary. So, yeah. you know, we celebrate by dressing up and going down. That's cool. That's fair, that's cool. So, okay. So, so costumes, uh, costumes to customs. You wrote this article for Mobile. Yeah. Awesome title. Tell us like, tell us about, tell us about your journey. So it was, ex like I said, it was accidental. Um, I uh, was in college and, and finished college. And then, uh, you know, of course, life being the way it is, um, got pregnant with my first child, uh, who is older now, <laughs> shall we say, fully grown adult. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not going to mention that, because that will date myself a little bit. Um, but you don't look, you don't look that old to have, have a child. It was, oh, my God. You know, there are days. Uh, but anyway, so yeah, it's a lot of, it was a lot of fun. Um, and I was a stay at home mom for a couple of years. Um, and when I started to go back to, you know, want to go back to the workplace industry, I was in Maryland because I was in the, um, Northeast Baltimore, Northeast of Baltimore, or North, yeah, Northeast of Baltimore, um, suburbs. And there wasn't really much of a call for costume design. So uh, I just decided to see what I wanted to do. So I ended up getting a job, strangely enough, at a distribution center, a million square foot distribution center that had just been built. Uh, and I drove a forklift and, uh, you know, did, did stuff in the, in the, I started moving into the office because apparently I knew computers and none of the managers did. Uh, so <laughs> this kind of gives you an idea. Computers were in the office were still new. Uh, okay. All right. uh, so the I moved into the office, uh, became a trainer um, and, and a HR, worked in HR and, uh, you know, did training, training and development for this um, million square foot distribution center. Uh, didn't have any problems, but I decided to go back to school and, um, uh, you know, life happens. I end up uh, meeting my, you know, getting divorced very early on and meeting my uh, current husband and I moved to Virginia, got jobs in administration. Uh, you know, I went back to con continued my education in HR because I realized I liked HR. I liked the dealing with people aspect of it, but I also yeah. liked the policy and process piece. So I was going to ask you, so, yeah. so, so the, the people aspect drew you to, would you say you're a people person? Uh, you know, everybody in HR starts off as a people person, but then they realize, you know, people are not all that great. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you get an HR because you think you're a people person. Then you, yeah, and then you're like, like then you I understand who people, people are. So. <laughs> Actually, people. No, I, I do. I, I really do. I, I think every every situation brings a challenge, but um, you don't get into total rewards um, because you. You know, I don't deal with people on a regular basis at, at this point in my career. I, I deal with um, the policies and the processes and the people who deal with the people. Mm -hmm. um, so I very rarely get involved except when we have either, you know, high level executives. Um, I get involved in, in their situations. So uh, I've been dealing with several individuals going to, you know, Switzerland right now, um, high level executives. So, you know, the, the movement to global mobility, I was finished, finished my bachelor's degree, had another baby, got my master's degree while having a baby. Uh, that's the great thing about online wow. school is that you can, you know, have an infant and I'm up at three o'clock in the morning up anyway. So why not do some schoolwork? Yeah. 
Wow. Uh, yeah, it was great. It was it was actually really really effective um, for what I needed at the time, and and so I got my master's degree um, and had moved into administration. And in, uh, you know, once I got my bachelor's degree, I kind of asked my current company, which was a government contractor at the time, and I said uh, I'd like to move into HR now that I have my bachelor's degree and I'm getting my master's. Uh, what do you guys think? And they they were like, well, we're just opening up this new group called, uh, you know, the Global Mobility Office. And I'm like, what's Global Mobility? What, what does that mean? <laughs> Never yeah. heard of it, you know? Right, so right. Uh, they were like, well, they need an administrator. They need somebody to help them kind of get organized. And at the time I was an admin. So it was kind of a good segue into um, a different group. Um, and then within six months, they promoted me and moved me to do uh, the actual global mobility. So strangely enough, I was, we separated ourselves into um, locations. So I was the person in charge of the Middle East, right at okay. the breakout of the Iraq war. Yeah. For a government, For a contract. government contractor. Right. <laughs> Right. So that so was like a, oh my gosh. Yeah. But it was, it was, you know, forget the, forget the frying pan straight into the fire. Mm -hmm. um, but it gave me some really interesting challenges and, and made me think outside the box. So I was very proud of the fact that, um, you know, I kept talking to my, my leaders and like the, the CENTCOM basically released a memo and said, everyone must have a visa, you know, and you're dealing with Iraq uh, in the middle of a very tumultuous time. And, and the uh, Iraqi government was in shambles. So they didn't know how they were going to get visas or even what the process was. Immigration was the last, least of the yeah, problems at that Yeah, exactly. Point. So, you know, I, I ended up, you know, I was in Washington, D.C., Northern Virginia area. I ended up hopping on the metro, um, going to the Iraq embassy and asking uh, one of the lower ambassadors, uh, how, do, how do we do this? We, we want to be compliant. We want to do what you expect us to do. Help me um, mm -hmm. and, and tell me what to do. And he basically said, bring back the passports and um, the, the paperwork and I will stamp them. Um, so I ended up making visits, uh, scarf respectfully on, on the hair uh, to uh, the Iraq embassy on a weekly basis. For so you wore a hijab in there? To, uh, not a hijab because that's a very, you know, that is a religious. Uh, oh, it's a, relig you know, it's just it's a religious cut. item. I just wore a scarf to be respectful over my oh, hair yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, because you are, you, you do want to be respectful of the culture uh, that you're dealing with. Sure. So, yeah. Um, just one of my pashminas, you know, that I had as a shawl, uh, wore that over my, over my hair and, uh, went and uh, really liked it, starting to deal with people from other cultures. And, and right. that was one of the, the most fun things. It was completely out of the box thinking, but we got fully compliant in a very, very short order. How many, how many of those did you process in that oh, short gosh, amount of time? Probably that was a long time ago. So a couple hundred, I think. Wow. Yeah. So, wow, that's yeah. incredible. So what did you learn from that process in doing that? Um, sometimes you just have to go to somebody and ask. Um, sometimes there is not clear guidance in what you what is needed to be done. Mm -hmm. So go to the expert, go to the person in the country or the person from the country and say, what do I need to do here? Uh, what's going to make this work? Um, rely on the experts. Uh, you know, we, we do a lot of work with various different countries. And I don't know exactly everything about the Brazilian social insurance system uh, to understand what somebody's going to lose when they move to Mexico. But I do, you know, know who to ask. And that's, I think, the, the key piece is rely on your experts, rely on your network. Um, they I are, love that. They've saved my rear end so many times. It's not even funny. <laughs> I love that. And I want to talk yeah. about how you transitioned from the government contractor into kind of where you are now. But before we do, I want to go ahead and check in with some of these folks and just honor some of the people that are leaving comments here. Um, yeah. And go ahead. And, and if you're watching right now, go ahead, leave a comment, hit that like button, uh, you know, send Jody a little a little heart there, you know, <laughs> send her some love, you know, Fernando from Brazil. Hello from Sao Paulo, Brazil, pretty cold here today, 45 Fahrenheit. Thank you for converting that to Fahrenheit, by the way, <laughs> Fernando. Uh, super cold for us. Sorry, the beach is closed today, Fernando. Uh, Katie, she's a proper horse person. <laughs> All right. I don't even I know am, what that is. Yeah. Are you a horse? 
Are you a horse person? Uh, so it, no, it, there's. I think Katie is talking about a story that I'll probably tell later when you're going to ask Ooh. random questions. Yes. Teaser. <laughs> okay. Janaina, hello, love and reload people. Jody and Ben. Here is Jana from Rio with love. I love the people from Brazil. I, 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 this is great. Rio's. I've got somebody in Sao Paulo right now that I'm trying to move to Mexico. So. Yeah, they're <laughs> great. The, the the Brazilians are like. Yeah, so underrated. Annette, hello from Cowtown, Fort Worth. Talk about underrated. Cowtown, Fort Worth is amazing. If you've never been to Fort Worth. I have not been to Fort Worth. I've been to Austin and I've been to Dallas, but I have not been to Fort Worth. So, so I love Dallas. I was born in Dallas. I got family in Dallas. But Fort Worth is like it's much cooler, you know, sister city. You mm -hmm. know, it's like Dallas is Dallas is the one, you, you know, you marry, you settle down. Fort Worth's the one you want to go out with, you know. Fort Worth, <laughs> or, you know, that's that's where the fun is. Okay. We're talking about dating a yeah, city. We're, we're dating cities over here, okay? We're dating okay. cities, all right? It's a family program. We're gonna keep it clean. We're gonna leave it there. There you uh, go. Bilar, <laughs> greetings. Hey, Dad, checking in. T Town, which is code for Tulsa, which is information nobody needs. Uh, <laughs> Rim, Rim Beckers, howdy, Ben, Shannon. Jody's fun. Yes, we know that. Um, Victoria, hi, Ben and Jody. Victoria's from the DF Dub. Victoria, you ever get to Cowtown? Let me know. Casey Gale, sending smiles. Janet, Janet Turner. I do. I love steampunk. Yes, I steampunk. love steampunk. Love it. Help yes. people understand if people don't know what steampunk Steam, is. Steampunk, like. the aesthetic is a futuristic Victorian. That's the easiest way to explain it. Um, you take your Jules Verne uh, stories and you convert it into an aesthetic. And it's, um, you know, it, it's got everything to do with the costuming. But also, uh, we've got a lot of friends in kind of the steampunk world and several people who are um, artisans around building, um, you know, costumes. Uh, one guy that, that we know of uh, did a steampunk version of Iron Man. It's the coolest thing I've ever oh, seen in my wow. life. It was just like, you know, gadgets oh, and, and metal and, and rivets yeah. and oh god, it's so super cool. But yeah. <laughs> awesome. Great. Look it up. Steampunk Iron Man. Love it. <laughs> Kelly Garen. Hi, Jody and Ben. Happy Friday from Phoenix. Jack. What's up, Jack? <laughs> Jack, how are you doing? Love Jack. Jack and I have done many, many uh uh different uh, conferences together so yeah. I, I i i could see that because jack and you are both like always kind of out there and always kind of like you know there's there's a few folks that wear the corporate hat that really put themselves out there and like a, mm -hmm. in a way a lot of a lot of folks are more reserved and stuff but there's there's a few of y'all that kind of put yourself out there as, as thought what are you talking about? i'm reserved and, and we no, <laughs> i didn't mean that negatively but you know what i'm saying like i mean you're accessible you're accessible yes. that's what i'll say henri dussois Hello, everyone. Good to share a good time with you all again. Hello, Henri. Happy Friday from Galtown again. Yeah, I've been waiting for the interview. Brian Rivers from First Tech Federal Credit Union out in San Diego. What's up, Brian? Or is it Orange County? Maybe Orange County. Jason Collard. Hey, what's up, Jay? Good to see you. From FedEx there checking in. Rob Zeitz. Rob has a comment. It seems like global mobility requires so many different skills that it leads to people from a wide variety of backgrounds finding or falling into the role. One of the things I love about the industry. Let me ask you. Let me let me riff on this for a second here, Jody, because because you're. Sure. I think that's a great point. I mean, gosh, doesn't it feel like you're like a Swiss Army knife sometimes? You know, <laughs> like how do how does one person get all the skill? I mean, immigration, logistics, customs. Like, I mean, there's just so many facets. I mean, what do you recommend to people maybe that are getting into this business or say, hey, I like global business. I want to be like Jody one day. Like, what's what's the advice you give people? Uh, the the biggest piece of advice I could probably ever give is uh, be comfortable with ambiguity. Um, be comfortable with with not knowing something, um, and and be comfortable with being able to rely on the experts and and be honest with people and say, you know what, I'm going to have to get back to you on that because we're going to have to do a little research or or kind of confirm exactly what we need to know. Um, global mobility, especially on the corporate side, I, I'm going to be honest, it's not about knowing the answers. It's about knowing the right questions to ask. And, you know, when you're relocating somebody, that person may be gung-ho. They may have been, they, they may be gung-ho about going. They're excited about learning new cultures. They just, they don't 
maybe they haven't moved before and they don't necessarily kind of know what they're in for. Um, there's a lot of businesses in particular that I've, I've kind of had this, you know, ongoing argument for years. Services really do make a relocation successful because you give somebody cash. Great. They're happy for about five minutes. Um, right. you know, and then they realize they have to figure out where to spend that cash. And then they've spent that cash and, oh crap, I completely forgot about all of these other things I have to go do. Taxes. You know, taxes, get my car registered, you know, get a social insurance card. Where in the world do I do that? You know? Um, so it, it's relocating people, even if you've relocated domestically, it's a lot easier, but still I find that, that services are, really what makes a, a successful reload. So I have kind of had that ongoing argument with the business. I, I get it. We want to spend less money, completely understood. But unless somebody's done it 20 times before, don't just give them cash and call it a day. You yeah, let's talk, let's talk about the cash thing. Let's talk about the lump sum thing, right? Because this mm -hmm. is a, something I, you know, rant about all the time. <laughs> but I mean, what's your take on the on the lump sum thing? I mean, does it have a place in, in, in mobility? Not, I mean, it, it does. You know, it it absolutely on? does. Yeah, I, I think it's a necessary evil sometimes. Um, you are you are going to have those situations where you want a candidate. Um, I don't recommend it for situations where, you know, somebody's crossing a border. Absolutely not. Um, but if someone's relocated within the United States, I think there's some, some place for lump sum programs. I have a lump sum program. I'm not, you know, supremely happy with it. But what I did was I put together some, some requirements about using a lump sum. I, I put together, uh, well, you know, it, it, it's not just give somebody 5,000 and because somebody else negotiates better, they get 50. No, it, it's, it's an amount based on family size and distance. And it's a chart. Um, so, you know, here's here's your grade of your employee, uh, mid-level employee, entry-level employee, high-level employee. Um, and based on the distance that they're going and based on the family size, we we estimated costs of what it costs to move, what it costs to hire a, a hire somebody and help you, them um, pack and, and put their your stuff on a truck. Um, what that's we, really smart, by the way. Yeah, I like so, that approach. I mean, I don't like lump sums at all, but I like yeah. that approach because you're taking into to account the factors. Because a exactly. lot of people just say you're you're a five thousand level, you're a ten thousand, you're a fifteen thousand. But you're right. The the amount of dependents they have. I mean, they could exactly. be a, a high level with no dependents moving to your point one hundred and fifty miles. You know what I mean? It's not going to cost them nearly as much as it exactly. is if they've got five kids. You know? do, you take into, do you take into account whether they're a renter or a, or a homeowner? Um, no, because the lump sum policy is really not designed for homeowners. So I, okay. I do I do uh, explain that to our um, fantastic talent acquisition team um, that if, it, if they are a homeowner, most of the time they're going to be more of the mid-level person. We do have a policy that supports the, the home sales it's a little bit more uh, limited than maybe the executive or the high touch uh, home sale program. It's not guaranteed buyout, <laughs> but it at least gives them the, the help that they need uh, to sell a home. So I really do push that the lump sum is fine. Focus on entry level. I actually do not have a table for the executive um, grades. So it is uh, really based on, on you know, someone mid-level or lower that we want to hire this person they're great talent but maybe the business doesn't have a big budget that they can spend on a full reload uh i i think that there's a matter of compromise in many organizations when it comes to lump sums uh different organizations have different budgetary limits and so you've got to really focus on what is the what is the goal of the organization what's the what's the benefit here what's the driver um you know, if you want that top talent, if you want that engineer that can pick and, and choose from a couple of different offers, having a relocation package can really sell a company as a as a benefit, as we are an employer of choice. You know, we're going to help you. We're not just going to hire you, but we're going to help you get here. That, that's what I want to. Yeah, I want to ask you about that. Right. So. So what do you think the strategic role of relocation benefits are in a talent strategy so you know it depends on the organization we're when it comes to our reload program we've uh really kind of i spent a lot of the last three years uh 
continuing to evolve the relocation program. We went from uh, fully insourced to fully outsourced. We did put in place a lump sum policy because we saw lump sums were happening. I, I knew that was some, a need of the business because uh, we were in a very cost conscious time. And so I put in place the lump sum policy, but I put in place with some with some rigor around it so that employees weren't necessarily negatively impacted or given tons and tons of cash when they didn't really find it necessary. So we kept some some structure and some some real you know meat behind the estimates, if you will. Um, this is why you're giving them this money. But in the end, you know, my company is. Uh, we're, we're known as a manufacturing company, right. but we're not, you know, that's not all we do. We've got tons and tons of fantastic new technologies. We're really trying and building stuff that actually helps some of the most sophisticated buildings in the world manage their infrastructure, manage their building infrastructure. So security services, fire services, um, you know, it's not just your, your temperature control. Uh, it's not just your HVAC. So we have a, a we have a manufacturing population. We also have technical experts. We also have engineering and highly skilled, um, you know, developers and software developers and and uh, people that are writing code. And and so we we're really kind of evolving into more of a technology company. Do, do so you be there? Yeah, that's what, okay. That's where I was going to go, right? I mean, so so do the requirements of those different types of business units with different types of populations have different requirements from a relocation policy and program? I think they have different needs, uh, not necessarily requirements. They have different needs. So okay. uh, when we're and what I've tried to build is a set of policies and processes around being able to meet those needs. Um, it's not completely perfect it's, uh, yet. It, it, it's a work in progress. It's always going to be a work in progress. We're always going to look to how can we um, be efficient? How can we provide the most services for the least amount of money? <laughs> you know, I'll be honest. Um, this, you know, cash is king. Uh, sure. We in every, in every organization, we really want to deliver value to our employees, but we also have to deliver value to the organization and uh, global mobility and relocation is often looked at as a, you know, very expensive um, uh, effort and it is, but there's a reason for it. So what is the ROI? What is the return on that money that you're spending? And you have to kind of build that. The, the return is you get a happy employee who's relocated successfully. You get, an, uh, you get an assignment where somebody can come in and start working right away. Um, they're not spending huge amounts of work hours trying to help their family adjust um, and, and trying to find a place to live and acclimate to a new location. And, you know, assignments are exciting at the beginning. Right. Uh, it's all, it's all like it a fantasy in the beginning. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's a fairy tale in the beginning. Yeah, it's a fairy tale. It's like, oh man, you're paying me to live here. This is so cool. Yeah. Yeah. And then you're like, wait, the reality is I can't grocery shop because I don't understand the language. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How do I find Americans? How do I find my peanut butter? <laughs> <laughs> How do I find I my peanut Amazon. butter? Uh, <laughs> cool. I love it. I love it. Peanut butter as a as a mobility benefit. Well, um, you know, <laughs> <laughs> We're going to give you this policy and a year supply of peanut butter. <laughs> if you have children under five, peanut butter is a major thing. <laughs> it, is, it is. It's a staple. We go through quite yep. a bit. And I've just discovered almond butter, which is just mind blowing. Oh, almond butter. I love that one so much better. I still haven't gotten my uh, 12 year old to enjoy almond butter as much as peanut butter. Yeah, it's, it's, it's crack. And Jan Jack Jampel says uh, handling lump sum and role of mobility and being strategic depends on. The structure of the company and the culture of the companies. Yeah, uh, Jack and I have had some 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 fun conversations uh, about lump sums. Jack's very anti lump sum, and I and I get it. I completely get it. Um, he is anti lump sum, but he came on this very, show and yeah. argued with me about lump sums, and actually took the pro lump sum position. You know, so in a, in a turn, <laughs> in an interesting turn. Yeah. 
but it, he no, but it, 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 he's right. It, you know, it's about being strategic. It's about what is the what is the culture of the organization. And Johnson Controls, we're we're a Midwestern company. Um, we may be in 130 countries. Yeah, 130 countries. Wow. Uh, we may have you know 120 thousand, I think, employees globally. I did not um, realize you guys were that big. Oh yeah, we're huge. You know, we're absolutely you know a lot larger than than I think people realize. Uh, but we're also a, a Midwestern company that has been in the same um, facility in downtown Milwaukee since 1896, 1894, something right. like that. We've been in the same building. Now, granted, that building has gone, undergone some very interesting renovations. I was going to say. Uh, you know, it's now like a combination of four different buildings. Uh, don't quote me on this. I'm not the historian, but uh, right, right. you know, I've been there and I, I did walk out of one hallway on the third floor and, and pass through a set of double doors and I was on the fourth floor. I still am not exactly sure how that happened, but you know, that's what <laughs> happens when you kind of put, you know, small buildings together. Yeah. Um, but, but we have at the same time, we have this, this fantastic uh, facility in Shanghai. We have, um, you know, some of the most sophisticated, we're in like 90% of, of the most well-known buildings uh, in the around the globe. So it, it's really um, a, a different company than I think a lot of people realize. Um, you know, everybody, when you think Johnson Controls, you think of the, the A-Track, you know, um, but it's so much more than that. So how is it evolving? How is, how is mobility within JC, you know, Johnson Controls, how is it evolving? Uh, where do you see it going? You know, as the needs of the business change, as, as maybe new verticals open up, as you go into different regions or, you know, or maybe you're already there. Maybe it sounds like it's a very mature organization. So maybe you're already there. Maybe it has changed. But can you talk a little bit about the change of transformation? So transformation. It, <laughs> funny thing is companies transform in different in different ways. And so you have um, I've been in, in startup organizations where the company has really been, um, you know, kind of just building building an infrastructure and making stuff up as they go, um, and that's and that's great. You know, I've been in older traditional. I've been in very structured, um, you know, high tech companies that have been, um, you know, I've been in government contracting organizations, which tend to be a little bit more um, political, if you will. I don't play the politics game very well. <laughs> you know, I'm 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 a little too direct and honest for the political game. Um, yeah. So you will probably never see me with a, a big fancy title after my name. Uh, just a long one, but, a long yeah, one. just a long one, exactly. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, so companies companies evolve in different ways, and mobility has a, a great opportunity with those different evolutions to look at what are the company's goals? What are we trying to achieve as an organization? And maybe your, your growth is through, um, you know, organic growth and you're just growing because you've got great products and you're just growing through, you know, sales. And that's fantastic. Some, you know, a lot of companies grow organically and they grow through um, mergers and acquisitions. I've done a lot of stuff with mergers and acquisitions, especially, you know, in recent years. Um, my my current company has gone through a huge evolution since I started with the organization and that evolution started before I came on board. So we are not the company that we were, you know, five years ago. So um, I, I think it's interesting because when you get different leadership on board, when you when your company takes a different uh, a, a different path towards growth or a different plan, um, you know, We've sold off some business units. We acquired a very large uh, company, Tyco, positioned us globally uh, in a very different way than we ever were before. So, you know, you, you shift and mobility has a really good opportunity to help the organization shift because, you know, with any kind of shift or any kind of merger or acquisition, there's opportunities for growth, whether those opportunities are in new areas, whether those opportunities are to expand existing areas, um, you know, there's, there's still opportunities for moving people around. And that's in the end, what we try to do is just move people around to the best of our ability and to help them, you know, to help the employees actually do the job that they were hired to do and moved into the area to do. 
could be business development, could be just helping out a project, uh, you know, to develop a new product. It, it could be any number of things, you know, establishing a new entity, all kinds of stuff. I want to talk about the, the M&A space because I think that's really, really interesting. And in these, in these large multinational you know, corporations, you know, are, are, are doing a lot of a lot of acquisitions, um, you know, right now and have been. Um, but it's something not everybody has exposure to because it takes a certain, you know, it's kind of. Um, but but yeah, but what is that like? I mean, because I can understand. I mean, gosh, I mean, I can only imagine if you, if you go out and you buy a company, say, hey, I like your widget, you know, I'm gonna go buy you. And then you buy all the people too. Yes. You know, and they may not be sitting <laughs> and, in the they right have, spot. and they have visas and they yeah. have, you know, and they yeah. may not be in the place that we want them to be. And right. yeah, right. so. so what is that like? Like, can you walk me through like a hypothetical situation like where Okay, I like your widget. I'm gonna buy you, but now what? And they say, Okay, Jody, good news. We just bought widget company, you know, <laughs> make it happen. All right, yeah. Catch you later. So, <laughs> this this also goes back to my very, very long title. Um, I, I deal with the disability uh, and wellness program as well. And in disability in particular, you you have um, so when I work with some of the mergers and acquisitions teams, uh, Historically, it's all been global mobility and immigration, but uh, in, in Johnson Controls, it's also disability. So um, I'm kind of looking at it from the merger and acquisition and the data that we get and the number of people and where are they and what, what's the situation, what's the plan um, with, a, with a slightly different lens. Um, so it, it kind of makes me realize the mergers and acquisitions, it is really about the team that you have. Uh, and the people that are on that project. And you have to have the HR team and you have to have the, the right uh, people on that HR team helping contribute to that merger and acquisition. So um, I'm, I'm never one of the decision makers and, and that's okay. What, what I'm there for on a merger and acquisition um, is, or even a divestiture is really to help determine where are our potential issues. Uh, so for mergers and acquisitions, when it comes to mobility, uh, the conversations with the business are really about, okay, what's what's the plan? Are you going to close uh, these facilities? Are you going to move people? Are you going to have them, you know, be part of some other group? Are you going to have them uh, work remote? What's, what's kind of the, the plan? Who's going to stay? Who's going to go? Um, and then also for immigration, there's a big sponsorship issue because when you do mergers and acquisitions, you know, you're buying an entity, a legal entity, and that legal entity is the sponsorship method of having a visa in that location. Yes, and that's so, interesting. That company yeah. has sponsored that person to be there. And what happens Correct. to that company? Now, does that change their sponsorship status if that company is now acquired? Well, it has to, we have to update. In most cases, we're able to update the sponsor, okay. sponsorship status, but knowing who has a visa is essential. Um, and then there's a lot of companies that when you acquire them, they may not have that, um, that level of detail. Um, they may have said, okay, we'll only hire people who have uh, visas, which is great. But then, you know, you're also dealing with a new organization. They have their own culture. Um, and you have to kind of figure out, and, and it takes time. Uh, I'll be honest. I mean, you know, we, we acquired the, my current company acquired, Johnson Controls acquired Tyco back in 2016. We're still adapting and, and finding that happy medium between the old legacy Tyco um, programs and plans and policies and culture and the Johnson Controls programs and plans and policies and culture. Um, you know, it, it takes many years to really evolve into the new normal, the new company uh, as a combined entity. And uh, so, so maybe their position might have been completely different. So you have to not only uh, train people on what the new policies and processes are, but make sure that you know the, the right information to be able to make those decisions on, well, what policy and process are we going to go with, you know? So, so fascinating to me because, I mean, there's so many moving parts that all come together. And sometimes I wonder if these decisions to acquire companies are made with culture in mind, are made with the um, 
with the assumptions around what it's going to take to move people and what percentage of those people will make the leap and stick with the company. Because I think sometimes you, you buy a company under an assumption that you're going to keep 100 percent or keep 50 percent and, and, and that it's the 50 percent you want to keep <laughs> and not the 50 percent that shows you stay, you know, because I mean? yeah. there, there's that thing, too. I mean, these are people. Right. And it's like, how yeah. do we, you know. I, so I have a question for you, since you, you seem like you have some experience with the with the M and A piece, and and therefore probably group moves associated with it. You know, um, I was helping a company do a group move, uh, you know, here in Michigan, right? And and we did, and we went there, and we did the, you know, we did the kind of the dog and pony over two days, and we told them about their benefits and how it was going to work, and you're going to love it, trust me, you know. And we did the, the sell, you know, because yeah. they want to get I as many, that, people, yeah. you know, what I'm saying you do the. The, you know the the road show and and they wanted to get as many people to to destination as possible right that was their strategy that was their their end game and you know maybe 50 percent took it you know how, yeah, how, yeah. Do, how do you get yeah yeah how yeah what do you think is typical in a group move situation like from to to be able to keep let's say you wanted to keep 100 what do you think is typical and then how do Nobody you know will keep a hundred percent Right. Um, especially right. if it, when you're talking about relocating people, because not everybody wants to relocate. Um, there are a lot of people in, I had one in a, in a former company where we were presenting, you know, this, this option to leave New York, come to Florida. What's difficult about that choice? Hey, what's hard about uh, that? Yeah. Right? <laughs> you know? No state income tax, um, sunshine. Exactly. You're going you're gonna to come down here anyway. Why not do right. it now when you're 45 instead of 65? You know? uh, precisely. But we, we ended up having, you know, like less than 30% make that choice. And, it, and I'll be honest, it was those 30% who were kind of looking at this as an option of taking, you know, having the company help fund their retirement home. Um, you know, the, the purchase of their retirement home. So uh, unless that was that was their plan. But there are people, you know, <laughs> I'll give you an example. My family, uh, my father calls me the one who left. The uh, one who left? The one who left. I too am the um, one who left. Yeah. So, you know, my, my father's on the, on the dairy farm that was established by my grandfather, um, you know, and uh, my grandfather's been in, in farming in that mid-Atlantic, Maryland, Virginia area. He was in farming for years. You know, we can trace our family line in the that general vicinity, uh, not on that exact farm, but in that general vicinity, five generations back. And so there's a, there's a lot of people who have that very deep connection to right. where they live. Yeah. And, you know, so it takes a really kind of, I, special, different kind of person staying, staying in your area. That's not, that's nothing to be ashamed of. It takes a, a different kind of mentality to, to really decide to move and to take advantage of an opportunity. Um, and maybe it's the right opportunity and maybe it works out. Maybe it doesn't, but you're, you're kind of, you have to be willing to take a chance. Um, and some people aren't, they, they are, it's not worth it. They want to stay near their family. They want to stay near their, their children and their, you know, grandchildren and, and they want to be in that area. So you will never be successful in getting 100% of a population, uh, of an acquired population. Yeah. To and, and, take assume, a relocation. and assuming, but assuming you want as many as possible, right? Mm -hmm. Um, what advice would you give someone who's, who's kind of going through a group move? I was just talking to a guy who was, who was planning a group move just two hours ago, right? Yeah. You know, what advice would you give to someone that's planning a group move, either either because of, uh, you know, acquisition or some other reason to get maximum adoption of that relocation package? Is there is there a tip or trick maybe you could offer somebody? <laughs> Uh, no, not really. I mean, we you, didn't prepare for this. I'm just throwing yeah, stuff at no, you here. My bad. Best, you, you put together the best package you can and, yeah. and you, you give them, you know, as much information as you can. And uh, for example, in this uh, one group move, we were moving some people to, from New York to, to Florida. There was, um, you know, a small group that were really key to what the organization wanted to accomplish in Florida. Right? So, they really wanted these, these couple of key individuals. 
And so what the plan was, we invited them down uh, to the area. The plan was to kind of show them around, um, get a real estate agent, just to show them the neighborhoods. I feel like um, that would be a big part, the looks yeah, trip going yeah. down there. Uh, the looks trip, yeah. The looks yeah. trip is huge. Um, yeah. But you, you really have to present it and package it um, the best way you can. So have a really good package, have a look trip. Uh, get an opportunity for people to check out the area, give them as much information as possible to make that decision in an educated fashion. Um, <laughs> some things go well, some things don't. And for example, I had in this, in this group, uh, look -see trip, um, we had a great real estate agent lined up who was uh, really just going to do an area tour and kind of show them, not really focus on housing values, but really show them the area, show them what it was like to live in the area. She had been a long-term resident. Um, we were actually uh, good friends by that time. She'd helped me find my place. Um, so, you know, it was it was really just about showing them the area. And so the, uh, the van driver that I hired called me at three, this, this was happening on Sunday, and they called me at three o'clock on Friday and crapped out on me and basically was like, I have, I, I have to go to church. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure God's going to be there when you get back. It's Sunday. Exactly. <laughs> um, but uh, Hey, more power to you, but this is not helping me any. So yeah. I, I, I was frantically calling anybody that could help me out. And so I went to my boss and I said, um, you know, about about five o'clock, he's packing up the, to go. And I went to my boss and I said, I'm going to have a big charge on my corporate credit card uh, on Sunday. And he's like, what charge? And I said, I'm not asking for permission. I'm just basically saying I'm going to beg for forgiveness later, but it's going to be a uh, 12 person van. And uh, and he's like, why do you need to rent a 12 person van? I was like, that, that looks tour. I need a driver. And uh, he doesn't have a car. And he's like, okay, are you, you okay? We're good with insurance. We're good with safety and everything. I was like, yeah, it'll be on my corporate card. I'm driving. And he's, I'm like, driving. he's like, what? And he's like, can you drive a 12 person van? I'm like, my first car was a tractor. I can drive. <laughs> my first car was a tractor. Said, I love it. So, so yeah. So I didn't tell them who I was. I said, hi, my name is Harris. <laughs> you know, I'm going to be your driver for the today. And my name's Harris. You know, yes, exactly. And, and they were like, any relation to the, you know, uh, so-and-so. And I was like, no. Nope. <laughs> my name's Harris. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, drove them around. Uh, they they seemed to have a good time. I think it was successful. It got them, you know, interested in the area. It got them focused on on some of the great benefits of of living in the area and stuff like that. So we really sold it. But yeah, sometimes you just have to drive a twelve person van. You know, make it the best <laughs> the best thing you can. Um, you know, put together the best package you can make it the best, um, give them all the resources you can to make a good decision. Oh my gosh. That's great. I love it. Absolutely. Yeah. We got I, I do not hesitate to do what is needed to get things done. <laughs> Amen, sister. We got, we got a couple of people checking in here and just saying what's up here. Uh, and that says you are so right. Don't you love hearing that? Yep. Sometimes I just do the show to hear that. I don't get it at home. So I just come, I come here. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. My mother still thinks I move sofas. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So does half my neighborhood. Like, what do you yeah. do? I'm like, I'm a mover. They're like, oh, okay. You want to move my gun safe? <laughs> like, no, I don't want to move your gun safe. Thanks for that. <laughs> exactly. Oh gosh, Jennifer Anderson checking in. What's up, Jennifer? Victoria McCuller, Cowtown, a totally different environment. I haven't done the whole experience though. You got to go to the rodeo. You got to go to Billy Bob's. Girl, I'm going to take you out one night. We're going to go down there, Victoria. It's going to be a lot of fun. Get your boots on. Henri, I'd love to make my own steampunk PC. I game. would love to see that. I, I want to, I, I honestly want one of those keyboards, the old uh, typewriter keyboards for my laptop. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Big fancy brass iron, click, you, know, click, you know, click, click, click. click yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm sure, your, I'm sure your coworkers would love that. Oh, um, they make fun of me to no end, but they do anyway. So we're good. <laughs> yeah, we're good. no change. Uh, Mike Quigley, hello from the firestorms of Northern California. Oh, please Take be care. safe, Mike. Yeah, chill out, Mike. Take it easy, buddy. Jason Cobb, thank you. Thank you very much. Elvis from Memphis. I love it. People are wild. 
Drew says, I love that, Jody. It's not about knowing the answers. It is really about knowing the right question. Well, so, and knowing who to ask, right? Yes, exactly. Which is right? why I, I think building your network, getting to know people in the industry is so huge. Um, I do not know where I would be without my Deloitte team, you know, sorry, a little shout out there, uh, without my, my immigration team at Fragman, without the, the RMC Serva, you know, I, I really do not know where I would be without the partnership of the vendors. Um, and it's so huge. But just in general, even if you don't have a relationship with a, with a provider, knowing that there are people out there, you can throw out a question on LinkedIn. You can say, hey, listen, can somebody help me out here? Here's some, some thoughts. Um, the corporate industry, I think, is really great at that. They, we, we really take advantage of some options and some you know, phone calls and, and the uh, various different industry groups, local industry groups. Uh, and it's our chance to say, hey, I've never done this before. You know, have you, <laughs> anybody got any ideas for me? Where should I start? You know, uh, because we, we realize and we acknowledge that we don't know all the answers. Um, somebody well, complimented me on, on recently on knowing anything about social security from Brazil. And it was like, that's because I had to do a, move a bunch of people from Sao Paulo to Rio and uh, from Mexico to Rio and from you know, various different locations all into Brazil because we were building, you know, at the time I was with a company that was building up a, uh, a presence in, in, um, uh, in, in Brazil and, and realized that I loved the Portuguese language, can't speak it for nothing. <laughs> but, uh, you know, learning about the, the different pieces, um, they were like, oh, I'm so impressed that you know that. You pick up a lot of stuff in yeah. several years of doing this. <laughs> you do, you do, and and some and I and I know some some global mobility folks, you know, who are who are on the corporate side, you know, they're pulling their hair out sometimes. They're so stressed, and I'm like, you got to learn to lean on your suppliers because they know so much. They're experts, and that's their job is to give you information and yeah. help you be successful. So, oh, yeah. don't get me wrong. I am completely a um, uh, I'm, I'm terrible at, at like actually I meet with my suppliers often. And so one of the key things is they keep asking me because they know they, they need to ask me. They're like, what do you need, Jody? I, what's going on? What can we help you with? Mm -hmm. And that's huge because I will never automatically. It's not kind of natural for me to pass things off to people. Um, but I need to remember that I can do that. Say, yeah. hey, I'm dealing with this. Can you help me out here? You know? Yeah. And we're, we're, we're happy to help. I speak for all the suppliers out there. We're, we're happy to help. Um, Victoria McCullough, true needs matter. I've had an executive, I've had executive authorizations come over with exceptions, i.e. a homeowner, but no buyout. I think Victoria is kind of driving to the fact that, um, you know, when you put together, when you put together policies and packages, there's never going to be anything that's a perfect fit for everybody. Um, you know, and the business is often looking at, it, you know, businesses are often looking at how can I do this for the least amount of money? Um, and sometimes forgetting that there's a person behind that offer and there's a, you know, a family behind that offer. And it will never work if you try to nickel and dime it. Right. And sometimes like we look at negotiations <laughs> like, very transactionally, like how do I get the most for the least? But we forget that there's ramifications and second, third order effects from getting the most for the least. And sometimes, well, I mean, what if that assignment fails because they didn't have the proper benefits or, or what if they, what if the next time you go and ask them to relocate somewhere, they say, nah, I almost got a divorce the last time. So I'm not right? going to. Or they did know. get a divorce. Or they did get a divorce. Right. You know? And they're back in your office saying, hey, yeah. I need a $40,000 raise because I got child support and alimony. Because <laughs> you. <laughs> my decision, man. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's outside of policy. Yeah. Oh God! Lately, like yes. you need to talk to HR about that. <laughs> the other HR, though. Down the on, other on. HR, yeah. <laughs> Henri says, "Living in assignment often feels like going through the five stages of grief." Right. Hilarious. You you have to say goodbye to things that you never realized you would you would have to say goodbye to. It's like mm. you know, just being able to. Um, you know, you're you're used to based on where you live and where you're from. You're used to things that you don't have to think about. Like, I don't have to think about where I go for coffee. I, I know where mm -hmm. I go for coffee. I've got three options right on my block. 
they all know my first name. Uh, <laughs> it's really bad. Uh, a little yeah. bit of an addict, if you can't tell. I have a relationship uh, with my favorite barista. Right, well. exactly. So, yeah. you know, my baristas know my name. My, my son gives me crap about it all the time. It's like, this is really bad, Mom, when they know your name when you walk in the door. <laughs> They're like, hey, Jody. Hey, Jody, what the use? Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, so yeah, it's, uh, you know, making sure that there's enough, uh, support there throughout the life cycle of the assignment is, is really key because you can't just kind of toss somebody out to a new location and expect it to be successful without some help getting them there. And it's not just about the employee, although I've seen some great successful employees that where assignments failed because their family didn't like it. Um, and it's not that the employee wasn't willing to kind of go for it and, and take advantage of an opportunity and was looking at, at the potential career uh, benefits down the road. And they loved new challenges, but their family was at a certain stage in their life. Spouse had a full time position, you know, and uh, a lot of connections to the local area. It just didn't it didn't work out because they didn't discuss it with them first. I've seen that. <laughs> you know. So you can only do so much, but you try to try to provide as many services as possible. So, you know, throughout the life cycle of the assignment, the employee is, is adjusting and adapting and enjoying their new location. <laughs> On recent Joe Ryan, I agree. He says, Jody, is there anything you can't drive? Uh, there are several things. I, I'm not going to take the, take the wheel of an 18 wheeler anytime soon. Um, so, our, so my job is, really like, I'll, I'll be honest. I don't like stick shifts. I, I I'm weird. I don't like stick shifts. I, don't and I learned years and years ago and I've kind of forgotten everything I know, <laughs> but, yeah. um, uh, I, I do, I can pretty much drive any kind of size vehicle as long as it's an automatic. <laughs> I, love it. I love it. Rob says you're a Renaissance woman, both in costume and in practice. Oh, y'all should see the pictures. <laughs> that's funny. That's a great. That's a great place to 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 kind of leave it there. A nice way to put a button on it there, uh, or bow on it, Rob. Um, I do want to give you the last word though, Jody. Is there something you want to leave us with today? Uh, folks have been very active here in the comments. Uh, it's a final thought, maybe you want to leave us with this Friday. Uh, the best thing I can say is is that COVID has kind of thrown everything for a loop. Um, you know, please forgive yourself for not trying to solve all of the world's problems while staying at home. Uh, please realize that we're just trying, many of us are, are being very successful in this time at home. Great, more power to you. Others of us are just trying to stay sane, <laughs> you know, and, and stay engaged and stay energetic and not go into, you know, uh, bouts of depression. And, you know, it's, it's a struggle, I think, for everybody. Um, we're, we're struggling, I think, with many of our employees uh, stuck in locations that they do not want to be stuck at. Um, I, I can't get a few people back to the U.S. because of the visa ban, the, the immigration ban. Um, so we're just trying to help people out as best we can and, and adjust as best we can. We don't know what this, you know, quote unquote, nor normal um, is going to be like. Uh, I am not a happy full time work at home person. Uh, I like the ba I like balance. And um, so I just encourage everybody try to find your balance. Yeah. It, it's okay to not be, like I said, solving the world's problems. Um, very much, you know, one of the things I want to get from my board behind me is um, uh, keep calm. Reload on. <laughs> Keep calm, reload on. Yeah. That's awesome. That's an awesome uh, sentiment to, to leave it with. Yeah. And, and uh and and you know, I think I think a lot of times I try to solve the world's problems on this on this episode. But next week you guys are on your own. I ain't gonna be here. I'm gonna be on vacation. Okay. Enjoy. Yeah. yeah. Have a fantastic time. Yeah. So you guys are on your own, solve your own problems next week. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much, Jody, for being here with us and sharing your story and sharing these great perspectives. I really appreciate it so much. Yep, no problem. Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks everybody. Thanks everybody for chiming in. All the great questions and comments. I appreciate you. Uh, as stated, Janet and I will both be on vacation, not together next week. So there is no love and relo. Um, so you're on your own. But take care, everybody. Thanks for being here. Appreciate y'all. See y'all on August 31st. Take care.